Hi, Monica. So nice Hi, Mary. to see you today. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm so excited. You are located now in Tampa, Florida. How's the weather in Tampa? Uh, it's a little bit chilly today, but it's sunny and beautiful. How is the weather in New York? Oh, it's rainy and cold, but oh. um, we'll have to go to see you in Tampa. <laughs> I'm so excited to see you. I've known you for a long time, and now we get to uh, to work on this project together. And um, I'm particularly excited today because you're going to speak about Professor Robert Gillies, who recently passed away, who was a wonderful scientist, and his work um, needs to be known by as many people as possible. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to everybody. If you don't know, this is Dr. Monica Pernia. And uh, she is a uh, gerontologist and a palliative care physician in uh, Tampa, Florida. She has um, a heart of gold, a brain, brilliant brain, brilliant mind, endless potential. And um, I'm just so happy um, to, to know her and to hear her presentation um, today. Thank you so much, Monica. Thank you so much, Mary, for inviting me, and I'm very happy to be here also to share some information about uh, Professor Gillis' amazing body of work, and um, also to be able to participate in this great journal club. So I'm just going to start by saying that um, Dr. Gillis, he uh, was a researcher who unfortunately passed away recently. He spent the last 14 years of his career uh, at Moffett Cancer Center. And his work was very important in different fields. But I think the ultimate goal for him was to try to understand better how cancer works, how is cancer biology, is metabolism, and find better ways to diagnose it and treat it. He did research in so many levels. He did culture research, he did um, a clinical trials, drug development, and he's considered the father of the field of radiomics. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about it. So I'm very honored to be presenting his work. And I'll be talking about one of his last papers. This is a review article that he wrote um, about the cancer heterogeneity and metastasis, life at the age. And um, this is a beautiful paper, not only because he explained things in such a straightforward way, but also because it's a beautiful summary of his work. That was so true to him, right? He always, his way to explain, he made, made complicated things um, more simple. Very easy, yes. And um, so some of the things that he starts by saying in this uh, paper, he said, well, Tumors are not homogeneous, well-mixed systems. And uh, the way that that he um, the way he utilized to illustrate that for us was citing the work of Dr. Gellinger and collaborators. It's a beautiful paper that was published in 2012, where they um, took different tumors and metastases from the same tumor and did cross-sectional cuts, uh, which is something we can see in panel panel eight uh, on this square right here, mm -hmm. and is to show that the tumor, um, just to see how it was histologically and genetically, just to the profile of that tumor. And they found out that the tumor had different regions that had very distinctive different zones that have their own kind of their own histology. And actually the grades of the tumor were different depending on the zone. And they did also a study of the different mutations and they found out that the different regions within the tumor had different mutations and not all the mutations were shared by all the regions. And when they did a phylogenetic study, they also found that the different regions of the tumor had different degrees of um, evolution. Some of the regions, when compared to the normal tissue, were more primitive than others. So this was mind-blowing at the time because we used to think as a tumor and the cancer as like a unit, right? But now we are 
uh, sure, we have evidence that says that it's just a heterogeneous system. And then he said, well, um, Dr. Gilly says tumor heterogeneity exists at many scales. And because of the existence of this physiologically and genomically um, different regions, we can say that functionally these regions are most likely different too. And he started calling these different regions of the tumor habitats. Mm. And um, he invited us to explore some of the studies that evaluated these regions in particular and the spatial or spatial and molecular heterogeneity of these tumors. For example, one of the um, investigations uh, showed the um, expression, the different expression of the Bruton tyrosine kinase in a, a single glioblastoma tumor. And in the same single tumor, the expression of this only one enzyme was different depending on the region. And many other studies using also um, imaging were able to establish the um, differences in between the regions in the same tumors using a squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus, breast cancer, and other types. So then he said, well, oh boy, we have a problem here mm -hmm. uh, because there is the existence of functionally distinct habitats within the tumor. And that of course can affect prognosis, can affect uh, response to treatment. And I would like to, uh, for you to take a trip with me if I tell you that you should pack a carry-on to go to the Antarctica for a weekend, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> and I tell All you, right. okay, okay, Mary, what do you think are the pieces, key pieces that you need to go to the Antarctica to put in that carry-on? Uh, coat? A coat, probably that's <laughs> one of your first, right? But if I tell you that we're going to go to the Antarctica, but first we're going to make a stop in the Atacama Desert in Chile, <laughs> but you cannot bring more luggage, you can use, you have to use the same carry-on, but that, that makes things more complicated, right? But if before going to the desert, I tell you that we're gonna make a stop in the Amazonic jungle. And before that, we're gonna make a little stop uh, in the Caribbean Sea, just, you know, hang out for a few hours there <laughs> before we finally make it to the Antarctica. Then probably packing that carry-on will be a little bit more complicated, don't you think? Certainly. So the same, not exactly the same, but similarly happens when and we just have one or a set of a few drugs to treat a tumor. That's why cancer is such an extremely uh, disease. Uh, it's, such a, it's extremely difficult to treat because uh, it's not the same. It's not homogeneous. And what a region can be uh, very sensitive to a drug, but that the same drug might not function or might not be effective for other regions within the same tumor. So that's what makes it more so challenging. But then Dr. Ellis says, go ahead. I was thinking like, so when a tumor shrinks on radiology, it could be that the cells that were being treated by the tumor shrunk and that other tumors cells remain that are not being treated by the drug. Is that what you're saying too? that um, this heterogeneity is quite complicated and important. Yes, it's, it's important because some regions might have clones of the tumoral cell that are, that are resistant to treatment. And that might explain why there isn't a complete response mm -hmm. to a particular drug. But then Dr. Gilly says, well, okay, but this is bad, but there are some good news. Uh, he says, well, we can use non-invasive radiology to try to diagnose tumor heterogeneity and see if we can use this information for prognosis and hopefully for treatment one day. And that's why he and his group of brilliant researchers came up with this idea of the um, radiomics or develop some of the fields of radiomics, um, which is um, just taking those characteristics present in imaging like MRI or CT scans 
and those characteristics that are cannot be seen by the human eye and use mathematics and algorithms to try to uh, create patterns called radiomic fissures um, to study and uncover some uh, tumoral regions and patterns that can be uh, important for prognosis. Um, it's a brilliant idea. Yeah. And very complicated too. And um, he invited us to read about a little bit about that, especially uh, the paper here on the left where he was the leading investigator. Um, so they use radiomics to explore the complexity of the uh, tumor heterogeneity as a fact prognostic factor in lung cancer. And they found out that there was a significant difference in the way that the tumor arranged itself in the core, in the center of the tumor, in comparison with the edge of the tumor. They found that the edge of the tumor were a lot more disorganized than the center. And that correlated with the capacity that that tumor had to invade the local tissue. So the more disorganized, the more likely that tumor to, to spread and go to the surrounding tissue and distant, uh, cause distant metastasis. So that's why he was particularly interested in this uh, tumor stromal interface. What is happening in between the edge of that tumor and the surrounding tissue is that it might be the key to understand why cancer spreads and why it causes metastasis at a distance or why the cancer comes back. So he uses um, um, imaging perfusion MRI to study the edge of advanced breast cancer treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And they found out that those areas that were poorly perfused at the edge of the tumor were more likely to recur even after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So that's why he was very interested in studying the tumor stromal interface. And he concluded that, well, maybe this is with more evidence and using deep learning, which is artificial intelligence, which is something that can be used in the field of radiomics to have even more detailed imaging and data about the heterogeneity of the tumor, is that we can use this to predict uh, prognosis. And we can focus not on the whole tumor, but we I think we should focus more on the tumor stroma interfaces. That was kind of like the thought of Professor Gillis and his team. And that is why the name of his review article is Cancer Heterogeneity and Metastasis. What is, how is life at the edge of that tumor? That's what it means. <laughs> I was trying, when I read this article at the title, I wasn't sure, but that's such a great title now that I understand um, his work. Yes, amazing work. Um, and uh, just before I, I continue, I just have to say that majority of the papers uh, that he cites here are just part of his work. He has more than 350 publications and a lot of them are in this field, how um, we can study the edge of the tumor to understand it better. Um, so then um, he cites these very, significant groundbreaking paper where he was also a co-author, um, which examines the tumor edge interface in more detail. Okay, so here I am presenting um, this, one of the most important images from uh, this body of work that Dr. Gillis also included in his review, where it shows the immunohistochemistry of invasive ductal carcinoma of the breast what they did is that they found um, different, they try to find the presence of different markers in the tissue from the center of the tumor and the edge of the tumor. So they first uh, did an H and E coloration to see cell uh, uh, density. And then they try to find um, those molecules or proteins that were linked to 
an acidic environment, which is something that they suspected. So they used um, the first thing that they investigated was the presence of the carbonic anhydrase 9, which is thought to be one of the responsible for uh, the creation of a low pH, wherever it is located, especially in the extracellular space. Mm -hmm. So they noticed that the car carbonic anhydrase was more present in, at the edge of the tumor. So the staining was the stronger here that in the center of the tumor. And that which would make means lower. That would make the pH lower at the edge of the tumor. Exactly. That means that um, this is uh, was making the pH lower. And not only that, the CA9 is also an enzyme that is um, found in hypoxic conditions. So in order to prove that, they decided to say, okay, but let's see if we can find the hypoxic induced factor, which is present where there is hypoxia. So that's why in this panel here, the one before last, you can see that the hypoxia induced factor is also the staining is stronger at the edge of the tumor oh. than in the center. I see. So so we can say, okay, so we can, we can say that probably there is a more acidic environment at the edge of the tumor and that acidity is related to hypoxia. They also wanted to um, make sure that there weren't other factors contributing to the acidic uh, environment besides the production of protons and CO2 by the carbonic anhydride. So that's why they explore the presence of glucose transporters here, because every time the glucose transporter is elevated, there's gonna be fermentative glycolysis, which ends up in producing lactate, and lactate is an acid, and that can lower the pH even more. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a surprise for them to find a, a stronger strainer, a, a, staining, I'm sorry, of the um, GLUT1 mm. in, at the edge of the tumor, that at the center. Um, and then they said, okay, well, we know it's an acidic environment. We know it's related to hypoxia. Let's see how the blood vessels, vessels are doing in that area. So they check for another molecule that is called CD34 that is related to vessel um, proliferation or, or circulation. And they found that they thought that probably it would be low, right? Because we are seeing an uh, hypoxic environment. But then it, that wasn't the case. They saw that the marker in the periphery of the tumor had um, kind of like a normal expression. So there wasn't really a hypoxic environment. So what they described was something called pseudo-hypoxia which is a condition that is also seen in diabetic patients. And in some conditions, it can predispose to the development of cancer. So this was like a, a very important highlight of his work. And the other two molecules we have here, this KI67 is a marker of cell proliferation, and the CC3 is a marker of apoptosis. So we see that in the center of the tumor, the proliferation is pretty much the same as the apoptosis. So we can say that it's like an stabilized cell turnover. Uh -huh. But if we move to the periphery of the tumor, we see that the marker for proliferation is a lot higher, it's, a, it's a stronger. So, and the CC3, which is the marker for apoptosis, is not as significant when we compare to the center of the tumor. So we can say that here at the edge of the tumor, the cell turnover is increased and it's, it's very fast. And because of the acid environment or related to the acid environment? In part motivated, or it can be related to the acidic environment. In mechanisms that we still don't fully understand, but definitely is one of the contributors to that. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Game changing. Game changing. Totally. Yes. And then um, then he said, well, after this, 
what can we say? There is correlation between local acidosis and local invasion, that's for sure. And he says, well, we should continue examining the tumor edge interface in more detail. He's cautious though, Dr. Gillis was very smart and he said, well, correlation is not causation and that's why we should keep looking. And then he said, let's see what happens. Let's see um, how um, the acid priming can promote metastasis. Let's see if that is something we can prove. Um, so what he said, well, the extracellular pH of solid tumors is acidic. That's something that we know for sure. But what is the effect of that acid pH on the behavior of normal and cancer cells in a culture? So then, he um, pointed out towards this research. Majority of these papers, uh, he was a co-author for. And don't worry, I'm not gonna let you go through all these things one by one because Dr. Gillis already did the work for us, mm -hmm. but I'm just gonna summarize it this way. If you inject or you expose some tumoral cells to a low pH solution, what we're gonna have is an increased tendency of cancer cells to metastasize, increased radical oxygen species, which can also irritate cells and participate in other um, mechanisms that can lead to uh, cell proliferation in a way that is not what we want, or increased metastasis to the distance, and increased cancer cell motility and can also increase the expression of markers for an epithelial to mesenchymal transition, which is a very important step. It's just the phenotypical change from a normal epithelial cell to a mesenchymal phenotype, which can be important for uh, some tumor types to metastasize. And then, okay, so if we add acid to, um, the tumoral cell and that increases proliferation and metastasis. Well, maybe doing the opposite, maybe acid neutralization can inhibit metastasis. And there are all these papers that try to prove that theory. And Dr. Gillis participated in all of them. And again, if you inject or give orally uh, to a subject, in this case, uh, most mostly were uh, muting models of acidosis or acidic environment. Um, high pH solution, then what happened was that the neutralization of tumor acidity led to an uh, inhibited cellular invasion into the stroma and also inhibited a spontaneous and experimental metastasis in many, but not all systems. And what happened is that there were some models of um, acidosis or acidic environment that were resistant to the use of bicarbonate, bicarbonate or other buffers. And um, those models had in common the expression of certain metalloproteinases, and that needs further investigation to understand well why they were resistant. So then he, he had the idea, well, um, what happened if we what happens if we give a patient an alkaline diet and um, bicarb oral bicarb, which is actually challenging because it has bad taste and it can cause uh, vomit in the patients, right? So he found this paper very smart people who um, did exactly that. They uh, took patients who had metastatic and recurring pancreatic cancer who were being treated with chemotherapy and they put them on an alkaline diet. And also um, they were supplementing by carb to the point uh, that the urine became alkaline. So they noticed that there were a significantly longer uh, median survival in those patients who had an alkaline urine. And we're talking about a huge difference. It was a 16.1 month um, oh my plus versus 4.7. So it was almost more than a year of difference in the survival. Amazing. Okay. Yes. So then how can we understand the invention, the invasion machinery of this um, um, cancer or tumor? 
So we know this is an acidic environment. We know this is very important, particularly at the edge of the tumor, which is what invades. But what is exactly the machinery that generates acid gradients at the invasive edge? Is the carbonic and hydrates nine the only culprit, or there is there are other mechanisms? So to understand this, we have the following uh, like diagram. Um, so there is some um, processes that happen in the cell, inside the cell. For example, there is a um, bicarb that needs to be transported into the cell, but several sodium coupled bicarbonate transporters. And then that bicarb gets converted to CO2 and protons. And the CO2, um, and that is a process that is caused by the CHU that is in the cell. And then those protons have to find a way to go all the way to the extracellular space where they should lower the, or they usually lower the pH. So the way that happens is through a very complex structure called uh, metabolon, which is uh, made with several coupled bicarbonate transporters and coupled with the uh, CA2. And then it, it functions like a channel to transport the proteins to the extracellular space. So this metabolome is also uh, joined to the CA9 and CN12 in the extracellular space. So these two molecules here, these two carbonic anhydrase are acting as an antenna or as a signal that guides the protons from the intracellular space to the extracellular space. And this is something that is independent from its activity as an enzyme. And that ends, ends up causing a low extracellular pH at the tumor age. Edge, sorry. But there are some questions remaining. So um, the mechanisms by which acid pH promotes invasion and metastasis are not fully understood yet. This is a beautiful picture of um, a brain breast cancer that was grown in a window chamber in a mouse. And um, they use a acidosis marker, um, a stain with a fluorescent uh, or, or link to a fluorescent molecule. And they can see how if this is a tumor and this is a stroma, there is a halo here in the interface of the tumor and the stroma. And that halo is what indicates is that there is acidic um, environment here. But we still don't know what causes um, this for sure. So um, there are some questions remaining and Dr. Gillis and other um, investigators try to find answers for those. So one of the things that uh, is thought is that the acidic impacts matrix remodeling proteases, uh, for example, uh, there is, uh, it can induce relocation of lysosomes in the plasma membrane, and those lysosomes, uh, they have proteases, catepsins, and those um, catepsins can also uh, make the environment acidic. And uh, there are also uh, release of tumor metalloproteinases. And um, an acid may have an impact on the matrix remodeling form of macrophages. So it is thought that probably lactic acidosis and the low pH itself can induce some changes in the macrophages that are important for cancer progression. But we still don't know exactly how this happens. Mm. So there are still a lot of questions to answer. But I think uh, part of the I think Dr. Gillis just paved the way for us to keep looking for those answers, and also um, just it's amazing how much knowledge we have now in these topics because of his work and and the research teams that he led with so much passion and 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 hard work. So I'm very honored that I was able to talk about him today. It's so clear that he was an amazing man and wanted would want us to continue with um, his work. And thank you so much to you, Monica, for your uh, 
comprehensive review of his work and really um, uh, putting it all together for us in a way that we can see how it might have unfolded for Dr. Gillies and um, future directions. What do you think is our next step based on all that you have shared with us today? I think I would be curious to know a little more of what would happen to patients with cancer with that alkaline diet and the use of buffers orally probably. Um, also, uh, not only to treat patients who already have cancer, but also to try to prevent cancer in patients who have mutations that are at risk um, for certain types of cancer. Uh, or familial diseases. Uh, so I will be curious to know what is what else is out there. And also, I'm not a radiologist, but this field of radiomics is also fascinating. Just it's like being blind and all of a sudden be able to see beyond what your eye can detect. It's just fascinating. I think so. I think there's so much, um, so much work to be done. Thank you for teaching us so well um, today, Monica. So nice to see you again. Mm -hmm.